everyone welcome to this new video from articulus and today i will be reviewing this aeon essay which is forging philosophy a 17th century classic of ethiopian philosophy might be a fake does it matter or is that just how philosophy works okay so let's just read it in 2017 and the australian journal of philosophy issued a rare retraction informing their readers that one of their articles was not in fact written by a cat, okay, so this is quite weird. The short article, a critic of David Lewis's vertical hallucination or something, was published in 1981 under the name of Bruce Lee Cat, a figure with no discernible institutional affiliation or track record of publishing, but who appears to have been familiar with Lewis's work, uh, as indeed he might have been being beloved pet of the great American philosophers. Okay, so there is a person called Bruce Lee Cat and uh, this person has no physical entity and he has not appeared uh, before uh, previously. So that uh, was a co that is a concern in this paragraph. It may uh, not have uh, come as a surprise to those familiar with Lewis's work uh, that Bruce Lee Cat was not the pseudonym of an astute critic but of Lewis himself. Okay, so I got an idea. So this uh, person, Bruce Lee Cat, knew what uh, this uh, author Lewis uh, wrote. So he was familiar with Lewis's works and art and uh, anything uh, which he is concerned about. And uh, this person is not a character which is made by someone else but Lewis himself. So that's what the author is saying. The playfulness of Lewis's writing is well known. For instance, the paper holds, co-written with Stephanie Lewis, is a dialogue between two characters, Argyll and Bargill. On the ontological status means the natural status of holes as found in uh, some food, I guess, crackers and paper towel uh, rollers, and in matter and in matter more generally. So, this uh, person Lewis uh, already wrote something uh, with uh, Stephanie Lewis about uh, a paper holes where he talked where he talked um, about uh, this uh, paper. Uh, with a different perspective, the or the perspective of paper, paper towel or crackers where holes are present physically. So this person Lewis is used to writing with uh, uh, a another perspective or a pseudonym. Pseudonym means a makeshift name. Uh, yeah, that's it. Okay. So nevertheless, the attribution of the 1981 paper to a cat seemed to cross a line. Okay. So this seemed to uh, cross the limits. It may have been playful, but it was also deceptive and the retraction. So that's why they took the matter, matter in their hands. Lewis was not only the 20th century philosopher to publish using an invented persona. Okay. The contents page of the book explaining emotions edited by uh, some Rorty features the essay Jealousy, Attention and Loss by one, uh, by one Leila some name. Uh, listed on the contributors page as an Israeli psychiatrist who uh, writes and lect uh, lectures on philosophic psych psychology. So, uh, Lewis was not only the one, there were other instances as well. Some readers might have, uh, the author just gave an example, so that's why I'm saying. Uh, some readers might have noticed that this is a, a rather unusual name, a pun on Leila Tov Ruach or Goodnight Wind in Hebrew. Okay. So this is a pseudonym made from the name itself and might have had their suspicions uh, confirmed by the fact that there is no discernible trace of the psychiatrist elsewhere on the medical or academic record. So the author is just giving an evidence that this happened before uh, this uh, Bruce Lee cat in incident. So this was accepted uh, previously but right now they are facing an issue. So yeah. Indeed, as an item of the University of California Press website really notes, uh, Emily uh, Oxenberg, Rorty and Leela are indeed one and the same person. Okay, so uh, some other author also used uh, pseudonyms. The case of Ro Tov Roach is somewhat different to Bruce Lee Cats. Okay, the, rather than playfully externalizing the critique of the originating philosopher's own argument, Tov Ruach's paper is included side by side with Rorty's own contributions to a volume that she herself edited. Okay. Two, uh, the, the two write on different topics and have different biographical entries in the volume but uh, are not in opposition. Okay. It is certainly so this is a description about what happened. 
it is certainly a more elaborate and less obviously tongue in cheek intervention that Lewis's use of Bruce Lee cat as an antagonist. Okay. <coughs> So how the uh, author uh, used uh, Bruce Lee cat and the fictional character to uh, manipulate some things, the author is just mentioning that. What are the ethics of uh, this kind of pseudonymous publication? When they uh, realized what had happened, the Australian Journal of Philosophy and the University of California Press evidently felt it necessary as a matter of academic ethics. So this uh, use of pseudonyms and using for different purposes is not a thing which is accepted by this literary ethics okay that's what the author is saying right now to uh, issue a clarification on the identity of the two authors okay so the identity and the physical entity should be present in i mean the author should be present in the real world otherwise uh, there will be problems i guess so there were pro- they were prompted to do so by uh, the unflagging work of michael doherty the sister Rath, uh, the sister Rath Casper Chell, uh, some person at Ohio Dominican University who has spent years unmasking cases of misattribution and downright plagiarism along, the, uh, along uh, with murkier, qu- quirkier cases like this. So, this uh, quirkier or weird cases uh, is being dealt by this person, Michael Doherty, and he is the sister, uh, the sister Rath uh, Casper, some, uh, he is at some position right now. For Doherty, such cases are primarily about disciplinary morality amounting to a willful uh, obstruction of the scholarly endeavor. On the uh, Rorty Tovrush case, he writes, it ought to have a, so he is against the act of this Bruce Lee cat thing. It ought to have dialogue with yourself under the two names is the, uh, in the published literature. I have no idea why she is doing this. So, this author is a, um, a woman. Dr. Rorty is a distinguished philosopher and the use of pseudonyms can impede the genuine history of philosophy. Okay, so this is bad for philosophy itself, the subject philosophy itself as the uh, this Michael, this person Michael is suggesting. Uh, it is uh, implied uh, in the, it is the implied question in Doherty's statement that interests me. Why is she doing it? So, the author is concerned about why uh, the person uh, which is uh, let me dr Rorty is doing this so the author is also wondering uh, why is, is she doing this why would any philosopher write under somebody else's name pretend to be someone that they are not okay so author is also trying to question why someone like me let's say me uh, is writing a book and also using a pseudonym to critique that book itself so this con- this causes a lot of confusion and problem to a person who is reading the book who does not know uh, that i am the only one to create that critique itself so yeah, that's a problem probably. If plagiarism is uh, the intellectual uh, sin of taking credit for someone else's ideas, what uh, are we to think of its opposite? Pinning one's own ideas on somebody else who doesn't even exist. So I want to uh, spread a propaganda and I am using someone else, let's say Rabindranath Tagore. He is not present right now, but I am using his word to manipulate his words to uh, spread my propaganda. So that's also a bad thing. In- instead of taking something, Forcing some uh, literature or forcing some idea into, uh, into someone's head is also a crime, according to the author. Okay, so while uh, it might seem odd in the uh, world of contemporary journal publications, smuggling ideas under someone else's name is rather more common in history of philosophy than why, than you might think. Okay, Medieval philosophy in particular uh, abounds with the text that blur the boundaries between anonymity, pseudonymity and straightforward authorship. Okay, so right now in this uh, contemporary world this might happen but uh, this has some history that's what the author is saying consider the various pseudos from pseudo augustine pseudo aristotle pseudo dion some person uh, the areopagite uh, that proliferated uh, in the late antique and medieval periods okay so th- there is some history to the, to these pseudonyms and people used Augustine, Aristotle as figures of uh, their, just like I uh, said in the example that uh, if I use Rabindranath Tagore, so I am also using uh, the, his character and also using his portfolio to spread my own uh, ideas. Yeah, so that's uh, that's uh, means in the history, that's what the author said. Uh, many of the medieval scholars use this kind of device to invoke the authority of an older figure uh, for their ideas, humble monks who wrote 
uh, under the names of mighty debt to gain intellectual clout and authority so uh, yeah people usually uh, did this in the history indeed uh, in a slightly different form this practice uh, has far deeper roots any philosophical dialogue using the names of real figures does something similar is plato socrates the real socrates or a mouthpiece for plato's own view so the author is questioning that uh, this plato this uh, plato used socrates to spread his own ideas or to depict what socrates actually said so this is a question with the author is raising uh, was uh, plato's uh, protagoras uh, the real protagoras or just a foil for plato's own idea so was plato actually uh, showing the world his own ideas or putting forward his own ideas and using socrates as just a figure and just a lifeless figure actually and if the later is there anything really is there really anything wrong with this okay so the author is also saying that is it actually wrong so the author is also questioning the opposite okay and what about the name under which a philosopher write does uh, writes does not refer to a real individual okay so the author is also questioning as whether um, this is actually wrong that uh, if i use a person who is, who is non existent in the world not uh, not necessarily a person who died but he is not present in the world itself so if i use let's say arya c uh, who, who is not uh, actually arya chakraborty but I, if i use arya c to depict my own idea so that won't be a crime probably okay so let's uh, continue reading uh, soren uh, some person wrote under uh, a great many names johannes uh, climacus constantine uh, some person uh, okay so this uh, soren uh, author he um, he or she uh, wrote under different names just like uh, johannes climacus constantine etc etc none of whom is uh, anything but the creative imagining of uh, this uh, soren person itself uh, himself in fact it's uh, perhaps more proper to call these personages heteronyms as developed later in the works of uh, fernando pessoa okay so uh, using different names and many names uh, as pseudonyms uh, is called a heteronym apparently Uh, in which uh, the different names are not simply alternative labels for an identical author hiding behind the label but denote fully concrete individuals so these are these persons are not um, the just names okay so these persons are not uh, critics just critics who um, the author does not want to push his uh, his or her own identity through this but uh, while using heteronyms he or she creates figures with uh, their own opinions and their own personality to uh, critique their own work okay so i think that's understandable pesa himself conjured more than 60 such persons okay so uh, this uh, pesa this uh, author uh, used uh, heteronyms uh, for 60 different times i guess so in addition t- uh, to the s- two semi heteronym that constituted a mere mutilation of his own personal time so the author can also induce his or her personality into those fictional identities so that that will be semi heteronym so you are uh, means you are adding one person's identity and your own identity to form a singular person so that person is not existent in the real world but uh, uh, yeah that's how you use heteronyms and finally the single orthonym that refer to the origin points of all these names peswa himself okay rotis use of an alias is in many ways is a uh, lot of use of an alias is in many ways easier to understand mainly because she tells us precisely why she wrote under a name that was not her own so uh, the uh, rotty actually explained why she used the pseudonyms indeed uh, lila top ruash was not uh, not her only pseudonym okay in addition to an israeli psychiatrist rotty also tried her hand at writing a chinese uh, platonist and in her edited collection philosophers on education she explains why she chose to write her uh, write her article on plato's council on education under the name of zhang loshan okay so this author rotty she uh, i guess yeah she did not uh, use lila tovrush as an only example she also used another identity um, she, and uh, that was an chinese platonist so she, uh, she used uh, lila uh, top ruach and also zhang loshar uh, for uh, two different contexts 
uh, ever since teach ever since teaching uh, a course in the history of philosophy in the people's republic of china 1981 and finding students and colleagues that passionately interested in that uh, they're passionately interested in plato i had been trying to see him through their eyes so the author wanted a change of perspective that's why uh, she used heteronyms uh, not heteronyms pseudonyms under the name of zhang roshan a chinese entity Although I wrote that essay, it is uh, in a perfectly straightforward way, not strikingly speaking mine. Okay, so the author did not uh, put her own ideas while uh, speaking to Zhang Luoshan, but she used uh, the Chinese student's perspective to uh, form that identity. Uh, it's an experiment I strongly recommend to all serious scholars. A uh, surprising features uh, emerge from the exercise. So the author is recommending this technique because probably. Uh, if she crit uh, if she can critic her own work or if you can critic your own work then uh, you can improve without uh, any external uh, motivation or uh, critic okay so yeah that's what the author is saying the aim of writing under the name of this non evolution philosopher was in rotis words and intellectual empathy uh, so the author suggests that the rotis she uh, is suggesting that uh, she wanted intellectual empathy and uh, she wanted to uh learn or to understand and agree with the uh, chinese students uh, and their perspective so that's why she created that zhang uh, lochan yeah understood uh, as the attempt to enter into the mind of another thinker uh, a kind of exercise okay this thinker who does not exist nevertheless take up uh, takes up a particular perspective on the world so she is not uh, a designing an entire entity in the physical or the real world she is just creating a mind map of a different person and uh, creating the perspective opinions and different things to form that mind it's just a uh, intellectual entity not a real world entity that's what she suggested this thinker who does not exist uh, yeah i already read this when the pseudonyms uh, author when the pseudonyms author imaginatively occupies such a perspective through the process of intellectual empathy they might uh, thereby see things differently okay today some uh, people might object to the case of roti as zhang uh, lochan on the grounds of cultural appropriation so some people uh, yeah, today might oppose this use of uh, pseudonyms and uh, using zhang uh, uh, lochan as a person uh, used by roti Uh, people can oppose this uh, point of view so and perhaps roti would admit that this is precisely the point so the uh, roti will also agree to that to appropriate that uh, to appropriate a perspective that's not one's own and that's not anybody's at all okay and uh, perhaps this is why she and uh, kire uh, so that per- the author which i talked about and pesoa but uh, not plato's or uh, plato or pseudo augustine chose names of thinker who never existed so as to have the freedom not only to appropriate an existing perspective but also create and uh, inhibit uh, one new okay so people uh, today might oppose uh, this use of pseudonyms from different characters of the world because um, today racism is actually a real thing and people uh, oppose xenophobic uh, mentality so that's why uh, in today the, this technique might not thrive but none of these examples from philosophical philines to pseudo augustine or imaginary chinese platonist is quite perplexing as that of hatata yera jacob the hatata or enquiry so uh, the author is talking about a different thing the hatata yera jera jacob so let's read about it is an unusual work of philosophy for a number of reasons so it's also a work of philosophy it is not only a philosophical treatise but also an autobiography a religious meditation and a witness of the religious wars that plagued ethiopia in the early 17th century it presents a theodicy and cosmological argument apparently independent of the other traditions of christian thought okay so there was a war happened uh, in the uh, early 17th century in ethiopia so the uh, hatata uh, this uh, this uh, uh, literary work is talking about that only and uh, yeah uh, what it does it it uh, uh, apparently indi- it is apparently independent of the other traditions of christian thought it employs a certain philosophical vocabulary that is uh, virtually without precursors finally and most perplexingly which is confusingly 
the progenitor or the originator of these ideas the zera yakob who is the subject of the autobiography and gives uh, his name to the title may never have existed so the author is talking about a similar kind of um, uh, work a uh, philosophical work in which uh, it uh, describes the ethiopian wars and uh, christian and religious thoughts also uh, and the author was not really a, a person so that's what the author is saying uh, why might we think this the text is composed in the voice of one zera yakob a man born to poor parents in the hands of uh, in the lands of the priests of aksum in northern ethiopia around the turn of the 17th century so the author also gives a background about this um, imaginary person known as uh, zera yakob given from his hometown by religious conflict between the orthodox and catholic or eponymous narrator uh, sorry uh, orthodox and catholic comma uh, our ep uh, eponymous um, narrator zera yakob uh, flees to the hills and finds a cave in which he meditated all day on humanity's quarrels and wickedness and also on the wisdom of the lord their creator who keeps silent when they act wickedly in his name persecute their neighbors and kill their own brothers and sisters so this person zera yakob uh, his background is basically given where he was uh, uh, he was not uh, satisfied uh, uh, not content with the situation in ethiopia uh, the wars and everything uh, due to religious factors and that's why he fled to a cave where he meditated all day and asked some questions about the humanity to god okay and uh, the basic problem of his philosophy is how to understand how god allowed this violent conflict to take place a version of the classic problem of evil and further to understand what if anything is true in religion okay so the um, person zera is also asking uh, what is religion is it necessarily important uh, in this world uh, so because that's um, because the religion is only dividing people and causing a lot of problem in ethiopia during uh, 17th century of course zera yako poses the problem by asking how we can decide between these two relig- uh, between two religions whose justifications and standards of justification are internal to their own systems of thought who decided everything according to their own creed okay where will i find someone who will decide truthfully because my religion seems true to me so does another religion seems true to them okay so uh, that's a continuation of the thought itself the problem is not only that uh, different groups disagree but that uh, there seems no way to resolve this disagreements without bloodshed okay so this disagreement between uh, religion and religious thoughts um, has uh, no conclusion whatsoever so they uh, decide uh, with the help of war and um, this fight his uh, answer is remarkable the only thing that can decide between competing religious claims is something that every human has inside them the god given faculty of lebuna okay so lebuna means variously translated as reason okay lebuna means uh, reasonability and um, logic that allows us to perceive what is right and what is wrong good and bad by means of it uh, being attuned to the kind of pre established harmony between the creator creation at uh, large and uh, this faculty itself lebuna is common to copt and ferenc man and woman young and old truth and goodness is accessible to all equally and yet humans do not use it it is wondrous to apply one's reason and mankind is by nature lazy preferring to be led by received wisdom so mankind does not use uh, lebuna or uh, reasoning or logic to derive their own fundamentals they rely on um, supernatural factors and uh, the reason which people induce in them so that's what the author is uh, frowning about not the author there's uh, this um, zera yakob okay the most trident chapters of the book follow with zera yakob using the normative standard a uh, standard set by lebuna to critique the religious practices and social organization of his day he criticizes slavery uh, for treating men like a beast asceticism for perverting natural desires and the practice of marriage for treating a wife as a slave of husband so uh, the uh, zera yakob also questions about the traditions and the rules in the uh, society when the civil unrest ends with the death of the emperor he returns to the society settling uh, in the town of uh, enfras 
where he finds work and eventually an intellectual uh, disciple in the form of a youth named Walda Hewat who urges his teacher to write down his reflections before his death. Okay, so he found a disciple who um, asked his um, uh, teacher to write down uh, his reflection, which means there are Jacob's uh, reflections before his death. He presents uh, here a vision of the good life as living in harmony with the natural order of creation, earning his sustenance and that of uh, his family by honest work. The historical details of the political background are all accurate. The language of text, beautiful, lyrical jeez, which means a dialect or language. So why I uh, think the, this character uh, so convincingly evoked may never have existed. So the author, right now the author is also questioning that these uh, people are questioning Zera Yeko, but the author is not content with that because the author is saying that uh, this actually happened in Ethiopia and uh, maybe a person uh, disguised as a man named Zera Yakob uh, uh, wrote this. So yeah, that's what the author is saying. Uh, the troubled afterlife of uh, the text begins when the work is discovered in 1852 by a lonely Capuchin monk a monk uh, named uh, Guisto da Arbun Samnim in the highlands of Ethiopia. Before this date, there is no mention of the text in uh, the historical record. So it, uh, this text was uh, dis- um, discovered in 1852 but it was written in the uh, 17th century. The work was sent off to uh, the Arbino's uh, patron back in Paris, the Irish Basque explorer, linguist and astronomer Antoine the some name and placed in the Ethiopian collections of the by some so, so it's a very difficult name to pronounce but uh, actually what the author is saying that uh, this text was found in 1852 by a person who gave it to another person to uh, uh, add to his collection over the next couple of decades scholars flocked to consult this fascinating seemingly unprecedented text the Hatata was edited and translated into Russian and late Latin and began to gain a wider readership among European intellectuals. Okay, so uh, scholars um, had a great interest in the uh, Hatata. Then in 1920, an Italian orientalist named Carlo Conti Rossini published an article in the journal Assita, uh, some name, claiming that uh, far from being a masterpiece of 17th century Ethiopian thought, the Hatata was in fact a forgery, which means a fake composed by the man who ha- had claimed to discover it, the Arbino. Conte Rossini had been tipped off by an Ethiopian convert to Catholicism that the Arbino had been scheming with local scholars to create heretical and Masonic works to undermine Catholicism and Ethiopian orthodoxy alike. So, this person, Conte uh, Rossini, uh, told that this uh, Hatata was a forgery, which means a fake, uh, by the Arbino, who was tipped and he was against the, this person, the Arduino, was against the Catholicism, which means uh, a certain kind of uh, Christianity, and Ethiopian Orthodox, which means the Orthodox Ethiopian thought, and uh, the, the, uh, the Arduino was uh, against it. So that's why uh, the Conti Rossini uh, told that, uh, means he thought that, um, that this person, the Arduino, uh, has been behind uh, all this uh, forgery or fake. Conti Rossini now started uh, seeing proof everywhere, adducing uh, philological arguments and cultural speculations in equal measure to, uh, con- to the conclusion that this book was written by an Italian in the 19th century, not an Ethiopian in 17th. So he also adds that it was written by an uh, Italian in 19th century, not uh, in 17th century. So he um, produces some arguments and uh, evidences against uh, this fact that it was written in 17th century by an Ethiopian. Conti Rossini was the preeminent Ethiopianist of the of interwar Europe, he, and his arguments were eventually accepted by m- almost all scholars, including those who had spent so long translating and commentating upon the work. But Conti Rossini was also a colonial administrator in, in Italian East Africa and a supporter of Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia. So this person Conti Rossini was um, also had some bias, uh, did, did also had some bias. So he was also against Ethiopia and its cultures um, probably. So that's why the author is also saying that uh, he was also not entirely true. Even going so far as to publish an article in 1935 titled Ethiopia is incapable of civil progress. So he was also against the Ethiopian people in general. 
arguing that the country could indeed should be colonized by a civilizing power explicitly invoking his refutation of the hatata as a part of argument so uh, this uh, controversy in general did not like ethiopia and he supported mussolini who was a dictator uh, at the time of uh, second world war probably and uh, he was uh, a supporter of mussolini's uh, colonialism uh, sorry colonialism the argument has raged uh, for more than a century now with uh, new arguments being made on both sides so there are people who support uh, conti rosni and who are against that person claude summer uh, summer a jesuit missionary who called himself canadian by birth ethiopian by choice made a passionate case of ethiopian authorship in his five volume ethiopian philosophy building on the argument of ethiopian scholars like uh, person 1 and person 2 the french historian anais uh, wion has produced an ingenious argument against ethiopian authorship so the author gives example that um, this claude sumner and uh, person 1 and person 2 were uh, for the ethiopian uh, literature and were against conti rosni and uh, the french uh, historian anais wion was uh, for the uh, uh, the conti rosni and against ethiopian literature Uh, has produced an ingenious argument against Ethiopian authorship in her series of articles, the history of a genuine fake philosophical treatise, and these argument arguments have been taken up by uh, by scholars like Fasil Merawi and Daniel Kibret back uh, in Addis Ababa. Okay. Finally, the late great scholar of Ethiopian manuscripts, uh, Geta Shu uh, Hail. Uh, reversed his position held for for half of a century so this person reversed his uh, opinions and uh, went from uh, went probably from against ethiopia to for ethiopia it's no exaggeration to say that today as an interest of in hatata begins to peak once again with a series of new books podcast and publication of a new translation of the hatata the question of its author's existence is in limbo okay so the author's existence is in question right now but uh, there are some arguments regarding the authorship of the book and some people are for ethiopian literature and some people are against it so that's what we have understood the difference between the case of lila top rush and zera yakob uh, is that the identity of the author of the hatata really seems to matter okay many ethiopian intellectuals are understandably proud of the work uh, holding it uh, up as a masterpiece of 17th century literature and foundation of an alternative uh, spe- specifically ethiopian path to modernity so ethiopian scholars actually uh, liked the the, the hatata and they supported it uh, and they are understandably furious at the idea that the writings of a faceless intellectual might deprive one of the greatest geniuses of um, this uh, of his rightful credit so um, they were again the fact that uh, the conti rosni was uh, uh, against uh, ethiopian literature and told that it was a fake in europe and the united states philosophers keen to diversify and decolonize their curriculums have seized on zeta yakob as evidence of an african enlightenment as an african descartes or kant as summer uh, summer put it the hatata demonstrates that modern philosophy in the sense of a personal rationalistic critical investigation began in ethiopia with zeta yakob at the same time as in england and in france if the work is a forgery it seems that the hatata cannot fulfill its this lofty role allotted to it the implication seems to be that if it is not written by a 17th century ethiopian scholar it is not at all that interesting or important at all so the um, western uh, philosophers also think that uh, this zera yakob received some credit and they wanted to decolonize their thoughts and told that the zera yakob was an ethiopian philosopher in general and the ethiopian scholars also believe that if uh, this zera yakob was uh, means uh, deemed to be fake then or claimed to be fake then uh, the uh, this uh, interest or the uh, means the gist of the entire um, literature seems to be gone so that's why they uh, that's what they are saying so uh, it seems that we do care, very much care who wrote it but should we the assumption on the side of both proponents and opponents of authenticity is that either the work is totally genuine in which case it uh, can be used to diversify and decolonize or else it, it is totally fake 
a mere forgery and little interest and of little interest other than perhaps a case of late colonial cultural appropriation okay so the author is asking uh, asking should we uh, care much about the authorship of the content or should we think more about the uh, thing which is written in the literature but what is a mere forgery anyway if you forge a passport you are creating a fake document that permits you to cross borders as if it were real if you forge a work of art you are creating a convincing fake that can be attributed to a known artist and sold as uh, sold at if it were genuine uh, but uh, what might be the forging of work of a philosophy be beyond attributing the work to someone else a la pseudo augustine or pseudo aristotle if painting if uh, faking a painting gets you uh, something uh, and faking passport gets you somewhere what does a fake passport a uh, fake w- work of philosophy get you okay so i formed it quite a few times in this paragraph so what the author is saying the author is saying that uh, faking a passport and faking a uh, art actually uh, is different from faking a work of philosophy because in the work of philosophy you are telling the world something and without your own interest but if you are uh, faking a passport or faking a art you are doing it for your own interest so these two are different things presumably what we care about more uh, most in a philosophical text are its arguments attempts to get at the truth and its meaning uh, of getting there and its means of getting there if the argument is uh, is what interests us then should the authorship matter given that the argument is exactly the same regardless who wrote it of course historical context is important both for understanding how the text might have be, have come to be and what the text means but unless the exploring of the context is employed in the service of understanding and elucidating the arguments we are treating the work of uh, uh, the work as a historical curiosity rather than a source of insight okay i, I will explain this later in the case of the hatara zera yakov this would be a mistake for for the arguments they are powerful and abidingly relevant these arguments about the causes of human suffering and conflict the epistemology of disagreement and twin, and the twin temptations of relativism and blind absolutism the relation between the world and our con- cognitive faculties are precisely what tends to fall out when the discussion of the hatata focuses exclusively on the trop- uh, topic of authenticity so the author is saying that instead of focusing on the historical context historical context is also important that the author is saying but he tells that instead of mere, just focusing on historical context we also should try to focus on the uh, content or the arguments or the everything which is written inside the book uh, or the uh, or the literature so that's what the author is suggesting us to do uh, this is because the author is saying that it is uh, relevant till today rather than uh, focusing on the ethiopian context we should focus on this uh, Uh, conflict suffering of human nature and the lack of cognitive ability the lack of use of cognitive ability is still present in the contemporary world so yeah we might conclude by offering a different sense of philo- philosophical forgery one less uh, concerned with the cultural politics of a particular context a uh, particular text than the words it uh, leaves on the page forging in this sense might have more to do with the work of a blacksmith than a counterfeiter so the author is also giving a uh, distinguishing opinion between the work of a blacksmith and work of a counterfeiter the uh, author saying that this is a work of a blacksmith rather than the work of a counterfeiter or a uh, fake thing maker rather than uh, uh, that rather than forging as deception we might think of forgery as creation namely as the creation of new words and with it new ideas consider uh, that whoever wrote the hatata did so in a language namely jeez that previously quite uh, literally did not have the words for expressing the most central idea whoever wrote the hatata forged a philosophical conceptual vocabulary so the hatata instead of just uh, giving the uh, the arguments and the uh, arguments and the topics about human nature it also uh, means uplifted the language or the dialect g so yeah so that's why the author is uh, praising that this is a work of a blacksmith or uh, rather a creation then a uh, counterfeiter who is just making fakes this process of linguistic innovation of coining new terms and adapting existing words to new meanings is by no means unique to jis so this was not only in the case of jis it was for other cases also let us see 
It was more than 20 centuries since uh, Cicero attempted to teach philosophy to speak Latin not only by importing original Greek words into Latin but by teaching philosophy new terms from his native language. Okay. In a way that uh, it takes place, so this happened before. In, in a way it takes place every time philosophy learns to speak a new language, including our own. We owe a great many words, both, uh, both arcane and commonplace, to the ch- translation of philosophy into English in the 16th and 17th, uh, 17th centuries. But le- rarely has it happened so suddenly, uh, su- in a such concentrated way, in a single text. This is impressive enough of its uh, author. Uh, sorry, this is impressive enough of if its author is a 17th century Ethiopian named Zera Yakob. If the work of a 19th century forger is an utterly astounding work of a linguistic and cultural immersion. So the author is saying that let's say that uh, this uh, 17th century thing is a fake, but still the arguments written in the uh, in the literature make sense. Today. Ultimately, the words on the page should be more philosophically interesting than the identity of the person who wrote them, and therefore Hatata should be ju- judged on the philosophical quality and linguistic innovations, not on the name at the top of the page. There is a sense that in which the identity of the author matters. So, in some case, the identity of the author matters, and uh, Rorty Rov, uh, wrote uh, Tov Ruach and Lang Doshan into existence, and uh, just as uh, KK Gard conjured countless originals, uh, original perspectives. Plato wrote uh, the perspectives of uh, Glaucon, Platagoras, etc. in a way that may or may not uh, have corresponded to the real view. So, the author is saying that uh, these are uh, forgery. This can be called as forgery, but Zera Yacob um, cannot be called as a forgery. Zera Yacob may, uh, may be one such voice that is an unknowable, unknowable, sorry, is an unknowable mix of uh, his, real historical individual and literary creation, but then again, so is Socrates. So the author is um, repeating the previous idea that we should consider what is uh, written in the literature ra- rather than the authorship and the other thing, the historical context, etc. So yeah, I think that's it for today.